Dr. David Wong, so great to have you here on Thrive Live 2021. Thank you for joining us. Doc, thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. I know we've had some good conversations in the past and really looking forward to having another good one with you today. So yeah, amazing, yeah. amazing, amazing. Yeah, no, it's been a great day and great folks like yourself talking about their specialties. Let's kick it off with my favorite question, which David is why periodontics? You went through dental school, you did all that hard work, and then you decided on your discipline that you're going to focus on. How did you decide on perio? You know, I like I like perio for, for a lot of different reasons. The biggest thing for me is I like the procedures. You know, that's kind of what suited my hands the best, if you will. I mean, I didn't really like cutting preps and I didn't really like taking impressions or bending wire or, you know, trying to ream and file a, a small space in a root canal. Perio was perfect for me because, you know, it's delicate surgery, but it's nothing major. I didn't want anybody's, you know, I didn't want to do cancer. I didn't want, I didn't want to treat cancer or anything like that, but it was perfect for me because it, you, you play a role in uh, reestablishing oral health and you got your aesthetic component, your tooth replacement component, and it's great. It's great. I love it. Yeah, amazing, amazing, amazing. So when, when you think about periodontics and you think about your practice and how you've evolved and where you're going to, well, how do you think about your philosophy of practice? What people want to know about you and and what you think about as you move forward growing your practice and providing this amazing high level of care for your patients and also for your referring dentists who are who are sending their patients to you what is your philosophy you know my philosophy basically is is i want to help you achieve whatever oral health care goals you have for yourself you know that may mean you want to keep your teeth for a lifetime that may mean you want to reestablish function or comfort to be able to eat without pain. That may mean you want to just look better for an upcoming, you know, a high school reunion. So whatever your goals are, I want to help you achieve that. And, and in Perio, you know, everybody's got different goals. You know, we've got, you know, chronic smokers who won't ever take care of their teeth. And then we have very meticulous people who want to do whatever they can, you know, to do whatever they to do, whatever they need to do to get what they want. I'm right. here to help them, you know, and I'm here, uh, you know, philosophy wise, I'm just here to help you meet your goals in a timely fashion, in a practical fashion and in a predictable fashion. Yes. Amazing. And, you know, when we think about going through college and going through dental school and going through graduate school, you know, there's a lot of focus on memorization and kind of less on creativity and, and even less on collaboration. There's a lot of us working alone. And now we get out and we realize that to be successful, we really need the opposite, don't we? We need creativity and we need collaboration, working both with our team and our, and our interdisciplinary clinicians who, who refer us patients and we work together. How have you met the needs of the patients with this kind of mindset, this creative mindset as, as a driver, how are you evolving there? Well, I, I think that's a great question. As a matter of fact, my next webinar with Henry Shine addresses this. Okay. You know, I talk about, man, I talk about this concept that was developed in 1996 by some, some guys from Yale. It's called, it's the idea of co opetition you know, and mm. what that is, is, is there are dentists, as you know, who play a zero sum game with their practice where in order for Dr. Levine to win, Dr. Wong has to lose. Right. The patient is either with you or or not with me. And we're finding as as time goes on that we have to it's a co-opetition. We do treat the patient. We are competing for their treatment plans and par, uh, portions of it. Maybe you and I both do implants. Uh, maybe you and somebody else in orthodontics does orthodontics. Maybe you and somebody else does endodontics. And so there is a competitive nature to it, but like you, you hit the nail on the head. We have to cooperate and play together because what we do is we're adding to the, the patient's overall value net in the, in their care. 
They're getting the best in restorative with you. They're getting the best in periodontics with me. They're going to get the best orthodontics or, you know, oral surgery somewhere else. And that's fine. That's what we need to understand is that there, there is an, an abundance uh, mentality with dentists nowadays to where you don't, somebody doesn't have to lose for somebody else to win. And that's, that's the best part about this. And that's what's evolved the most in my philosophy and what I try to instill, you know, to, to my dentist, you know, like for us, you know, it's periodontal maintenance. You know, they're always worried. Dentists are always worried that I don't want to send them to the periodontist because then they're going to keep my patients, you know, and, and they, they need to realize that that's not the game that we're playing. Most of us don't do that. Some do, some do, but most of us don't do that anymore. You know, we're here to help and, and be an asset to your practice and be a partner. You know, we're not, we're not fighting against you. I love what you just said. It's such an important conversation because as interdisciplinary dentists, whether we're perio, pros, ortho, general dentists, at the end of the day, we are there for our patients. We are there to build a team so we can deliver the highest level of care. And, and your thinking, what you're describing is, is the opposite of the zero sum game. You're, you're 100 percent right. It's, it's really exponential growth because we all work out of our own unique ability, which is what we love to do and what we're really, really great at because we focus on that. And if we, everybody brings their unique ability to the table, then we're going to have this synergistic effect. And I couldn't, I couldn't agree with you more. And I, and I love that, you know, we're, we're talking about that because the young specialists coming out of school, there's no need for, for that competitive mindset. It's really very important for us to have the, the collaborative thinking and the patient will win at the end and everybody wins because we'll create treatment plans that meet the needs of our patients. It's a great conversation. So then let's take it up to the next, next ramp, the next level, and, and ask, how is our technology going to enable us to improve that communication? How is our technology going to amplify what we do in our dental practice? And what technologies are you using today that's really changing the game if we went back 10, 15 years ago, and as we look at today and even into tomorrow? You know, there's a lot of technology out there, as, as you say, and, and, uh, it's hard. It's hard to figure out what technology you really need and what's kind of just a you know just a toy, a fancy toy. You know, for us, the game's changed in implantology a lot because we used to talk about restoratively driven implant placement, things like that. The problem is, is back in the day, this is you know I've been out 21 years now. You've been out longer than that, but 21 years ago, I mean, I would get a wax up and a suck down as my surgical guide, and that would be the restoratively driven you know, surgical guide. Now we have CBCTs. So I, I use the plan Mecca Pro Max. And I mean, they come in all different, you know, um, capabilities that are amazing because now I can sit down either in person or Zoom with a, with a referring doctor now and go, hey, you know, I know you want this tooth there, but, you know, it's not going to go there. You know, the implant can't go there or what are we going to do if, if we're off a little bit we're able to tr uh, plan things from start to finish a lot more. You know, we don't just, you know, plan the implant placement now. Now we can plan, you know, the, uh, the, the uh, custom healing abutment. We can, we can plan the temporary crown. Sometimes we even can plan the final crown, you know, to where it's okay. the, we, we take that abutment on, off, take it off and on one time and that's it, you know. So it's really good for patients. Like you said, patients win in all this. And not only that, we get better communication between people like you and me because you understand where I'm coming from from a surgical aspect. I understand what you need uh, from the from the restorative aspect, and we all win because I have a greater understanding of restorative dentistry now that we have this technology than I ever did before. And uh, with CBCTs now, they're more commonplace. We don't have to go to the hospital and have them modify their settings on their on their big gigantic machines anymore. Uh, they're, they're more readily available. Everybody, you know, I'm, I'm seeing and learning that specialists have are, are more likely to have a, a digital scanner now. So we're scanning, you know, for, for our referring doctors so they can start to plan ahead. Uh, they're scanning for us. The other day I had a, a patient break off a tooth and she just happened to be done with Invisalign and her orthodontist 
you know, printed off the model so we could get started on her, her temporary. So this is, this is cool stuff. It's a cool time to be a dentist right now. That is so true how technology is enabling what we're doing and it's only going to, it's only going to get better. It really is. And so when you think about adoption of new technologies and when we think about, you know, the, the industry moving forward, what do you think is holding back a number of dentists from adopting these new technology? What do you well, think, what's going on there? You know, I think a lot of it is a lot of just a lot of dentists, you know, and, and some of this is, is uh, you know, our own doing, right? Because we're always preaching evidence-based everything, right? So everybody, everybody is always waiting. I want more evidence. I want more evidence. You know, uh, they don't like this study. They want a person study. They want a long-term person study. So we're, we're always waiting. As dentists, we're very, we're, we're very uh, slow. I think we're very slow adopters, you know. You know, I wish we were more like my teenage kids where as soon as something comes out, they want to go buy it, try it and play with right. it, and tweak it. Dentists aren't like that. You know, there's a handful of us that are that are early adopters, but most of us fall in that the middle of the bell curve and wait for all of us to spend all our money and and, and uh, put put the put the old technology in a closet somewhere uh, before they'll buy the, ne the next they, they, they'll buy the next generation. Um, so I think part of it's just our mentality as dentists, the way we're trained to, to want to see the evidence. Yeah. Part of it's cost, you know, it's a lot of cost. And then the, the other thing is there's so much competition. You know, like if you were to buy a CBCT or a scanner or a printer, I mean, how do you, where do you start? You know, if these things were $500, we would just go buy one. We wouldn't care. But, you know, if you're looking at spending $100,000 or something on a CBCT and, you know, $40,000, $50,000 on a scanner, and then you don't want to, you know, the, the horror stories you always hear is I bought this and they don't talk to each other or they're, they're not compatible. Now I wasted my money or like I can't take it back. So dentists have that fear of, of buyer's remorse as well. Yeah, that's so it's so true. You know, building that I know myself, I jumped into a, a CBCT ICAD about three years ago and I was fortunate to have a dear friend who help me build a digital ecosystem. So whatever source it came from, whether it was an intro camera or a CBCT or a scanner, it went on every screen in the office, but you have to build a matrix and you know, there's, there's some technology to do that. But as we progress, these type of ecosystems and this type of development is, is, is going to be normal. And you're right. I like the expression that you have to get comfortable with being uncomfortable because you have to push yourself out of your comfort zone and, and go into these new technologies. And so for us crazy people who are the early adopters, so-called, thank you, Malcolm Gladwell. Well, it's true, you know, we are going to take that jump, but we're also gonna benefit from these new technologies because we don't know what we don't know. And then all of a sudden we see airway, we in our CBCT, we see sinus, we see joint, and we see all these things that we never saw before. And then we say, oh my God, thank God I made this investment because it's opening my eyes. And, and, and a lot of times that happens. So you, David, you gotta keep inspiring the generations and the dentists, whether young or a little bit older, you know, and we all got to give them all a nudge because at the end of the day, our patients are going to benefit. They're really going to benefit. And so as we talk about benefiting our patients and you think about the trends that we're seeing between the specialties, what do you think the trend is for us to be able to collaborate better? You know, I think there's so many different players. You know, I'm just going to use implant dentistry as just as an example because everybody's familiar with it and it seems to have their hands in it. You know, even, you know, from a technology perspective, you know, we talked about the CBCTs, we talked about the scanners. I think the next thing is, is I'm seeing more and more, you know, uh, specialists want to print their own guides, you know, so I, I'm, I'm starting to see that, that, that the integration of almost, you, you mentioned having a digital ecosystem. I see a lot of surgeons turning their, you know, their surgery centers, their, their, their practices into like a, a lab eco center, you know, to where they want to, they want to do it all. You know, they want the surgical guide. They want to fit the sleeves for every implant, uh, in, in, uh, implant uh, design. I mean, they want to make their own temporaries. They want to, they want to customize everything. And I think customization 
is something that that's trending, you know, because everybody loves that, loves that buzzword custom, you know, everything's custom. Um, everything, everybody likes the word precision, you know, so I think everything's aimed at putting a better product out there on the field for our patients. Um, collaboration wise, I mean, that's getting huge too, because more and more of my referring doctors are doing their own implants and they're starting to see more, right? Because they're, they're only doing like the low hanging fruit, you know, the, the big single molars and things like that. Now they're starting to see, oh, wow, you know, bone grafting is kind of important or, or soft tissue quality and thickness around an implant is pretty important, isn't it? These are things that you discover while you're doing it as you're in there. You know, otherwise, if if all you ever see is a, is a beautiful little healing abutment that comes back from the specialist, you don't learn these things. Yeah. So that's right. Once again, going back to that idea of co-opetition, you know, once seemed like the threatening thing to me, having referring doctors, you know, uh, place their own implants. Now I'm going, wow, I'm glad they're doing that because now that they understand what it's like to work in a patient who's asleep or who can't open their mouth all the way, who has TMD problems and things like that. So having everybody involved in the game of implants, you know, has really Im improved everything because now we're focused. Everybody's looking at everything. We're not only we're not just following the ball on the field. We're looking at everything. And, and that's what's what's neat about about implant dentistry. And so with that in mind, and we think about one of the most important steps in treatment for our patient is the diagnostics. And we say you, we move slow to go fast to gather the information and put the disciplines together. Let's go paint a scenario. We have a patient with a high smile line and a thin periodontal biotype and missing an anterior tooth. And your restorative dentist says, please place an implant. Mm -hmm. Let's think about what technology we can employ, what checklist we can employ that the restorative dentist has set up the team for success in replacing a tooth and deciding on the, the best treatment. How do you handle those situations with your referring dentist? And what's ideal for you, David? You know, and high smile line, thin biotypes and things like that. You know, the first thing to do is, is honestly, is just to, to raise awareness, you know, starting with the patient too. You know, I always explain to them, you know, like, hey, I understand you broke a tooth and you want that tooth replaced yesterday. I get that. I would be in the same boat too. But one of the things that we got to do is we got to slow our patients down. You know, that's a thing that right now in, in, in uh, trending now during this whole pandemic is slow dentistry. You know, that's a, that's actually a trademark term, I believe, from uh, McGill Stanley. Stanley. Yeah, low <laughs> dentistry, right? So, and I, and I agree with that because you're like, you don't want to get in a rush and be too hasty. So when I do this, with when the, whenever they come in for an exam, I'll do a smile design. I take photo, uh, I take really good photographs of their whole of their whole face, smiling, repose. You know, all your other ones. You know, with the, with the retractors and the mirrors, and I just educate them, and I'll tell them, hey, look your tooth is going to be really hard to replace and make it look good because maybe it's long and tapered. Maybe you already have, you know, a predisposition to black triangles. Maybe you have a hypermobile lip. Maybe you have a vertical maxillary excess. You have lip asymmetry. So I point out all that stuff at the very first appointment so they can start to think about it. You know, like, how do you want this done? Now, you may get an old guy that's 80 years old and says, I don't really care. I just, I just want a tooth so I can so I can break my fishing line and snap <laughs> off here and I'm good to go. Then you'll get the young, you know, the young girl that fell off the top of the pyramid and, and cheerleading practice. And, and it's an important deal. So I go through the same exam and let them know what it's going to take you know, to get them re restored back to where they were. And, and that's a, a concept that I call the preference ladder you know, where I just, we go through the ladder of each little thing that they want to do. And they'll, in their mind, they know, Hey, I, I, I want the papilla. I want the tooth shade, uh, shade and shape. Perfect. You know, I want, I want to be able to bite. I want blah, 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 blah. So they know in their head, the checklist, they can, they can see uh, as they're listing their preferences, how complicated their case is. That's right. And what's so important in these cases, David, to your point, is fig thinking about all of these important um, aspects of diagnostics 
for aesthetics. We say we start with aesthetics and then we follow with structure function biology because we can show the patient, here's where you are, there's where we want to go, very, what we say, Peter Dawsonian, right? Work backwards and choose a treatment plan that is going to get us there and explain, to your point, the limitations to our patients so we're managing expectations correctly. That's, it. That, that's, that's exactly right. We've come so far, you know, when I think of dentistry, I've been at it now for three decades. I'm more excited about dentistry than ever before because of this new technology of, of digital dentistry, of the workflow, and the energy of, of the younger generation coming into our profession with all the newness and our new knowledge. It's, it's, super, it's super exciting. So let me, let's close with this, David, a question that I'm going to ask you, which is if we thought about the future and we went forward 20 years, let's just go 20 years and we looked at where dentistry is going to be in 20 years, where do you think the profession will be if we think about these younger dentists in 20 years, you know, people in their 40s in 20 years, where do you think the adoption is going to be and where do you think technology is going to take us? I, I'm a big believer, Jonathan, in, in things coming full circle, you know, you know what, you know, bell bottoms eventually come back in style, man. And, and I, I, love think, I do too, <laughs> I do too. But you know, um, I, I think th things, things, the more things change, the more they'll stay the same. You know, there's still going to be some classic concepts and smile design. There's going to be classic concepts in, in implant placement and pros that that those are going to be you know laws and rules that that probably won't change much. I yeah, think sure. if anything, what you're going to see is is uh, in, especially in our field in perio, you're going to see a lot more growth factors and things like that where we're using you know science to grow bone instead of you know uh, brick and mortar uh, right. to grow bone. I <laughs> think implants, you know, you're going to see. You know, we've been, we've been stuck on titanium for a long, long, long time, and now you're seeing more and more ceramic, you know, implants and things like that. So I think you know, we're going to play around with that a little bit more. Um, I think, you know, the trend. I, I think we're going to constantly question old axioms, you know, like the stress theorem and implants. You know, where I think you know it used to be put in a bigger, longer implant. Now I think we're going to we're going to eventually grow shorter, uh, which we are. You know, we're putting in more shorter implants now. Um, we're going to, I think, uh, on another front, we're going to take into account the whole body a little bit more and not just focus on oral health. You know, you mentioned airway earlier. How big is that getting right now? You exactly. know, that thing's getting huge. So I think we're just going to learn more and more, but that's going to bring us back, you know, circular again to where, you know, like you said, we're going to, we're going to learn more about, uh, how aesthetics, function, structure, and biology play into our oral health, like airway. That's you know, right. it's not just it's not just you know pink and white. Like there's more exactly. Time. exactly. And maybe medicine and dentistry will collaborate greater for the good of our patient because we know the connection of oral health and overall health extremely well in dentistry, and we need to bring our colleagues, vice versa, working together because they come to us more often than they go to the physicians. So we do need to work collaboratively and the people that are working on this are, are really doing great work. Well, Dr. David Wong, it is so great to talk to you and thank you for everything you do with your team, with your, with your referring docs, and let's just keep at it, keep moving our profession along with open ears and open eyes for, for growth, for the betterment of, of our patients and, and our industry and our community. It's great chatting it up with you. Always a good talk with you. Yeah, enjoy the rest of the meeting. I know you're a busy man today. Yeah, we, we're going at it. We're having fun. We're having yeah. fun. Thank well, you, David. Thank you so much. A heck of a chat, Jonathan. We'll see you later. Thank you. Bye-bye now. Bye now.